about you, Megan? Yeah, we're on a good distance. So, next, we'll go ahead and get started here. So, we will be talking about Athens, ancient Greece, as you can probably figure that part <laughs> out. But before we get to Greece, we're actually going to start today in kind of a strange place. We are going to start today with a Bible story. So, anybody know what this is? You can probably figure it out. It's like our Bible show. This is presumably Isaac and, uh, and Abraham. Yeah, yeah, bonus points if you know the painter. Anybody? Decent. Caravaggio? Huh? Um, I believe it's Michelangelo. Oh, this is but, Yeah, which I didn't know did this one, but I, I have to teach you in Greek history and not, you know, Michelangelo. Okay, so if you're familiar with the story of Abraham and Isaac, and as I'm telling you this, I want you to think about you're hearing this back in the 1800s, you're in Northern Europe somewhere, and it's hot, and you've heard the story many times before because you grew up in the church, you already know this. So, but the story of Abraham and Isaac, basically, is that Abraham, you know, like many people back in the day, they would have to sacrifice an animal to atone for the things that they had done wrong, or in other cultures, you know, to make it rain, or just to get right with God again. Not uncommon. So Abraham is very used to sacrificing animals to appease God. Well, one day, God comes to Abraham, and God asks Abraham to, Abraham, I really appreciate all the animals that you've been sacrificing, but if you could, I would like you to sacrifice your son instead. This is the one and only son of Abraham, and God has just asked Abraham to sacrifice. But Abraham, you know, he's a, he's a faithful son of God, so he takes Isaac, he brings him up to the top of this mountain after a two-day journey, he puts Isaac on the altar, he's about to sacrifice Isaac, and right before he does, a messenger of God, an angel comes down and stops him and says, Abraham, it's all right, you've passed the test. See this ram over here, conveniently located like two feet to your left. <laughs> um, you can take that and sacrifice it instead. So it seems like the story has a happy ending, right? I mean, Abraham is able to not kill his son, which is always a good thing. But he also passed the test of faith with God. And Isaac didn't have to be burnt to death on the altar. So it all works out. Now, you just heard the story. You're in 1800s Europe. But you've heard the story many, many times before, and so you start to nod off just a little bit. You're very familiar with this. You already know the end. And so and as everybody is nodding along to this story, there's one man who lives back there called uh, Soren Kierkegaard. He's a philosopher from the time. Now, Kierkegaard, he's looking around at everybody, kind of nodding their heads sleepily after hearing the story, and says, hold up. God just asked him to kill his only son he asked him to tie him up, slit his throat, and light him on fire. And we're just, you know, accepting this? This is okay? <laughs> the point of Kierkegaard, he wasn't trying to dismantle Christianity or anything. He was actually a Christian, but he just had a lot of questions. And he wanted to appreciate what faith looked like. You see, Kierkegaard was pointing out that if Abraham already knew the ending of this story when he went into it, well, it really wouldn't be much of a test at all, would it? Kierkegaard has this quote here. He says, if there was a way for Abraham to know the end of this, he says, then let's forget him. For why bother remembering a past that cannot be made into the present? And that's the reason I just told you a Bible story. For why bother remembering a past that cannot be made into the present? In other words, when we know the outcome to a story, it takes the entire suspense away. If you were sitting back in that church and you've heard this a dozen times, you know the story of Abraham and Isaac. It doesn't really matter to you that much, but it's because that we, these people that lived back then in history in ancient Greece did not know the outcome of their story. They did not know how their actions would have ripple effects. So now we can go to Greece. All right, so a little bit of setup here before we get started. Uh, this is not going to be a war story, the things we're going to talk about, but it does take place during a war. So a little bit of context. All of ancient history does. It takes place during a war. It's a very solid point. Well, the present history, too. Yeah. What's the saying? Like, there's a Greek saying, I think it goes, it's like spring, summer, war. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is ancient Greece at uh, 431, right before the Peloponnesian War broke out. Short story of this setup Persia came over to attack Greece. Maybe 300, you might have heard of it, Battle of Thermopylae. Um, Greece was able to beat Persia back. This is a very short version. Persia goes back, but in order to beat Persia back, Athens formed this giant alliance to help fight Persia. But after Persia left, Athens said, you know what, this would make a pretty good empire. They made it into an empire, had everybody start paying them tribute. 
people naturally didn't like this very much. They didn't want to be part of this empire, not all of them. And so they complained to Sparta down here. And Sparta went to war with Athens after people asked them for several years. They're kind of a slow mover. But so <laughs> Sparta and Athens are now at war with their respective alliances, willing and otherwise. So during this war, Athens manages to build a fort right here. This is Pylos. This is basically in the backyard of Sparta. So Sparta doesn't care for this at all. They do not want a fort in their backyard. They come down here to take out this fort. You can go to the next slide. So this is a zoom in area where this is supposed to have taken place. Now, Athens had a fort built right in this area on this piece of land. Sparta wanted to come take it out. So what they did is they staged a bunch of soldiers right here. And they were supposed to come here and attack. But the information is a little spotty about the exact way this occurred. But really, all you need to know, a bunch of Spartans on this island getting ready to attack the fort. And then the Athenian Navy rolls in, clears out the Spartan Navy, and suddenly you had a bunch of Spartans stuck on an island. Now, there's several hundred Spartans here, and they're like top tier, cream of the crop Sparta. Sparta is all about producing a very high level of, not quite ability, I suppose, but uh, something along those lines. They have a respected class. So these Spartans are here, and strangely enough, though, even though this seems like such a stunning Athenian situation, Sparta makes deals with their slaves that, hey, if you can smuggle food out to these guys, we'll give you your freedom. Slaves want to take this offer up, of course, and so the slaves are actually so good at smuggling food out to the Spartans, it's not the Spartans that start, start to death, it's the Athenian Navy around them. Not start to death, but they're in a pretty bad shape. They're running out of supplies, they've been there forever, and this is dragging on and on. So it's the besiegers who are strangely besieged, if you can think of it that way. All right, so with that in mind, that's the background of what we're talking about right now. Let's go forward one slide, and we'll go back to Athens. Now, Athens, I'm sure you're familiar, direct democracy. Um, also, feel free to take pictures and send them to me afterwards, or my wife will let me return. Perhaps <laughs> um, so, back to Athens. Athens is a direct democracy. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Basically, what this means is that they're picking the generals. If they don't like the way a general is doing his job, they can kick him out in the best case scenario. If they really don't like the way he's doing his job, they will just kill him. There's a little bit of pressure on these generals, to say the least. And so this is the Nyx. This is a big rocky hill to the southwest of Athens. This is where all the Athenians would you know, vote and discuss matters and um, where they were complaining to a man named Nikias about this situation. Nikias is one of their generals. And my pronunciations are usually dubious, but it's all right. <laughs> um, so Nikias is their general. And essentially what we have here is the Athenian assembly on the Nyx. You can skip to the next slide. Just for a frame of reference, this is the Nyx, this hill right here. This is the Acropolis. And so all the people are on this Nyx complaining to Nikias about the current situation. They're saying, listen, these Athenian, our Athenian fleet is starting to starve to death. They're having troubles. Things are not going well for them. Why haven't you resolved this already? And the, as the people are all yelling at Nikias, there's another man that kind of steps up and is leading this attack on him. Now, his name is Cleon. Cleon, he's, at this point, he's not really been involved too long in politics, but he's a, he's a prominent figure. He's been around several years. And he usually likes to draw a very harsh line in the sand. For instance, a couple years ago, when a city rebelled against Athens, and they were trying to, after they beat them, they were trying to decide what punishment they should give out to this city that just rebelled. And essentially, Cleon wanted to kill all the men and take all the women and children into slavery. Now, obviously, it's a harsh punishment by any standards. Didn't get carried out. But that's where Cleon is approaching this from. So Cleon, back to our story, Cleon is yelling at Nikias about how if we actually had men for generals, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have this problem at all. This would have already been taken care of. And all the assembly is kind of rabble-rousing and yelling at Nikias as well. And Nikias and Cleon go back, by the way, so they don't have a great relationship. So Nikias is kind of tired of this. He looks down at Cleon and says, you know what, do you think you could do this job any better? And Cleon says, of course I could. Anybody could do this job. But Nikias presses him. And he says, no, really, do you think you could do this better than me? Do you want to be a general? And Nikias is kind of, or excuse me, Cleon is kind of taken back. He didn't expect this at all. He's at Cle um, Nikias is actually offering Cleon the role of general. 
And the Athenian assembly reacts to this in a couple different ways. Some of them like this idea. They like Cleon anyway. Sure, let's make him a general. We can all vote and make him general. Some of the others are like, well, we don't really care for Cleon necessarily, but we don't like the status quo, and the situation needs to be resolved. Then other people are just kind of amused. They're thinking, well, this is kind of funny that Nicias is offering Cleon the role of being a general on a dare. And so, sure, yeah, let's vote. Let's see what happens. So they vote for Cleon. Long and short of it is that Nicias gives up his spot to Cleon to become a general. The Athenian assembly just made a man the head of portions of their Athenian forces on a dare. So now Cleon has the problem of how to solve this island situation. I don't need to get into the details of it, but really long and short, he pulls it off. He kind of takes some credit where he probably shouldn't have. He borrows some plans from other generals, but he manages to go over to Pylos, capture all these Spartans, and bring them back. Now this is a huge deal. These are some of the best Spartans that Sparta has to offer. These are some of their best soldiers. So this is a major chip to play against Sparta. If you have these soldiers, you can probably offer a peace deal and they'll take it. You can get a good peace deal and they'll probably take it. So, let me go to the next slide. Cleon, when he brings these Spartans back, he actually takes all their shields, which they're never supposed to surrender, and hangs them around Athens as trophies. Look what I've done, right? And this is actually one of the shields. It's kind of hard to see if you click one more time, go one slide forward. I have very um, sophisticatedly <laughs> underlined where the writing kind of is. But you can see a little bit of writing here, a little bit of markings. Rough translation, it says, taken by the Athenians from the Spartans at Pylos. This is one of the shields they took from the Spartans. And they hung it as a trophy in Athens. Today it's in the Agora Museum in Athens, if you want to see it, if you're ever there. So, what do you think happens to Cleon after he pulls this off? What do you think happens to his standing in the city? Obviously, it goes up. He's seen as a hero. And so, the plans that Cleon has, the politics that he's had in the past, suddenly seem maybe a little more valid. Cleon was able to do things that no one else was able to do, right? And so, in the future, Cleon actually dies a couple years after this, fairly recently, or pretty recently in the time of our story, I mean. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Important clarification. This is very long. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Cleon actually dies, but later on, when a city rebels, what do you think happens to it? A lot of cities rebel, and some of these cities, a couple, if not many, Athens was pretty good in general, but some of these cities, in order to punish them for their rebellion, they have all the men killed, and they take the women and children and sell them into slavery. That is the politics that Cleon proposed, and although it's not direct, it's not fair to entirely blame Cleon for this, maybe. It's not fair to entirely blame the Athenian assembly for this, you know, at heat of the moment, much like Dan Carlin was talking about. Um, he steals my notes all the time. <laughs> but if you look, at the politics of Athens and how they changed, they went from trying to be, at least in theory, a just empire. If a different city had an issue, they could settle it in the courts of law. Might not be fair, but it was settled by law. Now, we have a time where Athens executed all the men in the city and takes the women and children and sells them into slavery. And you can actually trace it back to a time when someone in the Athenian assembly, when they were frustrated with Nicias, shouted out, I double dog dare you. <laughs> and Cleon becomes a general. There are these little turning points in history. The reason history is alive and pulsing, and we should not be viewed, and it should not be viewed as static and something that happened in the past and is no longer relevant, is partially because we do not know how our actions will impact the future. The Athenian Assembly had no idea that this would be partially a turning point to what would later end up wiping out a city. In, in, yeah, you can go to the next slide. So, fast forward a little bit. Just bear, bear with me here. Take your time. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to rewind just a little bit. Go back to the first year of the Peloponnesian War. Right when the Peloponnesian War broke out, there was a man named Pericles in charge. Familiar with Pericles? Most of us. I mean, if you know anything about the people of Athens, you probably know something about Pericles. Pericles essentially led Athens for 20 years or more. But he was a prominent player just leading the Athenian democracy and steering them. He's been compared to the rudder of a ship, not the man screaming at the helm, telling everybody where to go, 
but the guy silently in the back redirecting the city. This is Pericles. Now, Pericles is asked to give a speech at this funeral. You see, after the first year of the war occurs, what they want to do is the city has this public funeral to honor the dead of Athens. So these are all the men that have died in the war. They're brought out. There's a period of time where the families and everyone from the city can come out and honor them. And then after this state-sponsored funeral uh, starts to wrap up, Pericles is going to come out and give a speech. Okay, so think about that in the context of this conference, what we're doing here. Pericles was just asked to come out and look at the events that happened over the past year or so, and maybe take 20 minutes and talk to an audience about the lives of these men. He was basically asked to do a 20 minute history podcast. This is basically what Pericles was asked to do. And what is surprising about this speech is that for like the first half, the first two thirds, he barely mentions the men at all. You see, Pericles has a different approach. Pericles understands that it's our interactions with history that, you know, I'm speaking for him here, but Pericles understands that it's our interaction with history that make it interesting, that make it unpredictable. And so when he starts talking about Athens and these men, at first he doesn't mention the men and instead starts talking about Athens. He spends the vast majority of his speech talking about how great Athens is, that their constitution is better than anything. I'm not saying this is true, but it was very good so that, um, you know, based on the speech from Thucydides. But basically he starts saying that the Athenian system is better than anything we've seen. We have freedom for our citizens. We have more trade than any places around us. We're an excellent city. He's got this one line I like quite a bit uh, that goes, mighty indeed are the marks and monuments of our empire which we have left. Future ages will wonder at us as the present age wonders at us now. He's painting this glorious picture of Athens, but he's being asked to talk about these men that died. But it is towards the end of his speech that he makes a pivot to directly honoring these men. You see, as he gets to the closing portion of his speech, he's got this, uh, this quote here. Now, it's about a paragraph. I'm going to read it to you, so just bear with me. But it's also gorgeous. So he's talking to the Athenian assembly. The funeral's wrapping up, and he says this. I could tell you a long story, and you know it as well as I do, about what is to be gained by beating the enemy back. What I would prefer is that you should fix your eyes every day on the greatness of Athens, as she really is, and should fall in love with her. When you realize her greatness, then reflect that what made her great was men with a spirit of adventure, men who knew their duty, men who were ashamed to fall below a certain standard. If they ever failed in an enterprise, they made up their minds that at any rate, the city should not find their courage lacking to her, and they gave her the best contribution they could. They gave her their lives. To her and to all of us, for their own selves, they won praises that will never grow old. The most splendid of tombs, not the tombs in which their bodies are laid, but where their glory remains eternal in men's minds, always there on the right occasion to stir others to speech or to action. For famous men have the whole earth as their memorial. Now we're wrapping up here, but you see, Pericles is aware that we are both living in and causing the aftershocks of history. This path that history takes, it seems fixed to us, but for anybody else, those experiencing it, it is fluid. And that is anything but static. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. I don't know if you have any questions or anything. Uh, we can get this pretty informal. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure where you were going with the biblical reference at first, but I think you. Well. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I was like, how is he going to spin this? <laughs> trying to throw you off a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah, well, thanks for coming, though. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, buddy, cause, uh, Do you want to talk about your season two? Oh, yeah. yeah thanks. You've got yeah. Yeah. Ryan has long been bad promoting my Ryan show. Ryan is better promoting everybody's show than any of us are. <laughs> yeah, so what I was supposed to say there at the end, check out the show, History and the Making. Yeah, right. So I've got a uh, first season's about. Um, Ancient Athens from 500 to 400 BC, kind of the presentation that you just saw is how it is towards the end at least in the beginning, there's a bit of a learning curve. Um, it's storytelling, um, trying to make history come to life, and uh, really kind of the focus of the later part of the show is about the Peloponnesian War, taking a storytelling approach, trying to create a pithy with the past. So uh, a couple different things you can do, website, hitmpodcast.com, same for both Twitter and Facebook. 
So different groups. Uh, I think the website's pretty great, and you can listen to everything there. Uh, it's, I think it's well designed. It took me forever. And um, yeah, and then for season two, so that wrapped up. That took me about two years, and then that wrapped up in May. So that's the first season. Uh, 28 episodes long, and then at the end there are two uh, interviews with some prominent authors of the books that I used for sources. So it was great to finish that out by interviewing them. Who were those authors? They were, thank you, Ryan. <laughs> uh, John Hale, who wrote Lords of the Sea, which actually Ryan recommended to me. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. And then Melissa Lane, who's a professor at Princeton, and she wrote The Birth of Politics. And so, and that's kind of about the, uh, it's more of a political look at like the Athenian system and comparing it to our own day. It's, it's a great read. Those are two of my favorite sources that I use for the show. So check that out. That's the first season of History in the Making. And then the second season is coming up in, I'm hoping, January, and it'll be taking place in early America. So it'll actually be looking at the USS Constitution here. So it'll be taking the USS Constitution and basically following it through history of early America and kind of the trials and tribulations that we faced from about the time of like 1790 to 18, 15, 20, but don't hold me to that, it's subject to change. So yeah, <laughs> that's the second season. Yeah, thanks for coming. I do want to quickly yeah. ask, what yeah. are your thoughts on the role that history plays in politics today? Because I have this theory that our politicians are becoming less and less educated on history. Am I completely wrong? No, you're right. No, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually not going to have to write the correlation. It's not for the words in history, but I'm sorry. That's not going to have a direct effect on what we're seeing today and just causing this chaos. Because I do also have another theory that we can actually prevent a lot of the issues that we're seeing if we actually were all really well educated in history, especially in politics. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, some of the tricks that you see in ancient Athens are used today. I mean, painting somebody creating an enemy that's not actually there, and then mobilizing against that enemy, and then calling people you know, cowards or unpatriotic when they don't act. That's a very old trick. And, and I'm not trying to paint it to one side or the other. Like, I mean, both sides have their issues. But yeah, I mean, I basically agree with what you just said. People are more educated, they're aware of the past, at least to know the tricks. Honestly, the way Carlin put it, I think, is excellent in his talk earlier, where all these tricks have been done before, but we keep falling for them because we have a short memory. So yeah, I do. But what is it that's influencing us to just not remember history? Like what's going on lately more than ever before? No, that's a good question. Um, Attention spans are shorter, shorter now. now. <laughs> Attention spans are much shorter now. Yeah. yeah. Technology. Like things can go bad one week and then something, and then you completely forget it and something else. Hits. It's like that, it's that, that flashy light, we get followed by the light and forget everything else that happened. Partly, yeah. there's a lot of things happening and we yeah. know about them all. Mm -hmm. Like. Things have always happened in history at all times, but now you can hear about everything. The, like, it's hard not to have a short attention span when the number of things that happened, like last week, can any of us even remember that was like five really horrifying things that happened last week? And I, I would have to sit down and try to remember what they were. And they were last week and they were horrifying. Yeah. And, but there were five of them. So by the fifth one, so I think you know, it's, it's hard to like, it, it feels like everyone's on a hamster wheel and that doing the thinking about the past is too hard because you're just trying to keep up with now. That's part of it anyway. Yeah, I think there's kind of a catch-22 where back in the day you didn't have enough information, or at least not enough information, but it was harder. You had more time, yeah. but you had less information. Now we're in the opposite end of that. No. Yeah. Sorry for coming so late and basically only hearing a last sentence, uh, <laughs> but I'm a big fan of your show, and uh, now that you're here and forced to ask, answer questions, if you can meet anybody, any characters that you've talked about in your podcast, mm -hmm. who would you meet and, and what would you talk about? The first person that comes to mind is Themistocles. Um, Themistocles was kind of a naval genius against the Persians when they were coming over. He's the one that essentially created this, the Athenian navy, or at least was one of its, you know, like founding fathers, for lack of a better word. And um, it, he's he's very daring. He makes a lot of gambles, and I would kind of want to get a feel for why and how he made those gambles. What were his actual thoughts about how it would work out? There's a good example where. Um, Basically, at the final battle, or the Persian Wars, the last like, big naval battle, Battle of Salamis, where all the Greeks are terrified of the Persians, so they're all thinking about running away. And so Themistocles knows that this fight needs to happen right now while they're prepared, or if they scatter, Persia will crush them. And so he actually tells the Persians where they are. He says, we're right here, come and get us. He acts like he's a traitor, and it works. Like The, the Persians come to try to get him and crush him, and then they fall right into his trap. So things like that, I mean, it's a giant gamble. You're basically telling an empire where to find your only navy. So I want to talk about some of those gambles. Yeah. Curious, I, I look forward to listening to this. I'm not familiar yet. But 
Um, in storytelling, the the fifth century, do you create an arc over the course of the season? Do you yeah. have like a central thesis that kind of runs through or threads? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the actual title of the first season, I only put it in a few places. I think it's on my website, but it's titled The Justice of Athens. Because oh. I feel like the very beginning of the story, the way Athens is founded, it has a heavy emphasis on justice and trying to create something closer at least to equality and allowing the poor to operate against the strong and vice versa and balance them. But the way that they perceive justice changes as the story changes. As they become more powerful and they don't necessarily need to worry about what their neighbors think, the way they treat their neighbors changes. Right. And then later on, when they think they might actually be defeated at some point, then they're terrified because of the way they treated their neighbors. So a lot of it, the, the underlying theme, I would say, is justice. Cool. Do you, yeah. spend, like, do you, do you treat all the decades with equal uh, time, or do you, do you, <laughs> or do you dive into certain points? Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Um, I originally started this to actually just do a show about the Peloponnesian War. Yeah. And then, actually, I'm, I need to stop bringing up Carlin. But, I'm very sympathetic to him when he tries to create a story and then does a ton of back research and starts way back here. That's what happened to me. I was going to do a show about the Peloponnesian War, and, I, the and then I started like 80 years-ish before, 70 years-ish before it broke out. So um, later on, when I actually get to the Peloponnesian War, I feel like that's the time. I was happy to finally get there, and so I do focus on <laughs> probably like around the 30s the most, like 4:30 in that era. Yeah. Uh, I was so glad that he was doing the Peloponnesian War because I do a History of Greece podcast and I wasn't doing the Peloponnesian War. And everyone was like, when are you going to get there? I was like, well, just go to this guy. <laughs> I will get there eventually. Okay. In the right. meantime, <laughs> go there. Right. you got to skip to the end of the book. Yeah. <laughs> He's already there. Yeah. we got to talk about Paul. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the next are coming up. I appreciate yeah. it. It's super cool. Uh, I would appreciate it. Yeah. Oh. Oh.